I'm Batman. I'm Spider Man. I come over the house. We're best, best friends. friends. If you're like me, you first saw the wacky nonsense of Batman and Spider man during your formative years of late high school and college. A series of web shorts that you and your friends could laugh at and quote together thanks to its accessible concept of two friends helping each other out, who also happen to resemble two comic book icons. There's so much to love about this series, not the least of which is the seemingly simple but deceivingly complex animation stylings of a husband and wife creative duo, one of whom is now an Emmy Award winning creator. This is my look at the career of Lindsay Small Butera. How's it going guys? My name is Graham and this is Flashlight, a series where I look at the history of all things Flash here on the internet. In the past, I've mostly covered Flash game or animation series, but in this episode I want to highlight one artist who has been especially inspirational to me over the years. Even though her husband Alex is often a collaborator on many of the works we're going to be discussing today, I am more specifically looking at the career of Lindsay. She was kind enough to answer a rather large list of questions that I had for her, exploring her work, her approach, her inspirations, her own personal idols, and other fascinating details about her career. A full transcript of that interview is available on our Patreon, but I'll be sprinkling in snippets of it and other interviews of hers that I've found throughout the video. Lindsay is a designer, an animator, and a director, as well as one half of Small Boo Studios alongside Alex. They've both had working jobs in animation, but they also freelance for television, commercials, music videos, video games, and more out of their home studio. She's even worked as a teacher of animation design. In addition to looking back at her career, we're also celebrating the release of Small Boo Studios' first game, Later Alligator, a point-and-click adventure game about an unfolding conspiracy in Alligator, New York City. The game has a positively silly sense of humor, gorgeous artwork and animation, it's very creative and filled with mini-games and has multiple endings to discover. I am personally so excited about this game, it is out now, there is a link in the description, you guys should go check that out immediately. We'll talk about Later Alligator in a while. Crocodile? We're going to rewind the clock a little bit first. Lindsay and Alex's career and success as prominent animators really began with Batman and Spider-Man in 2009. The characters were cute, the animation was captivating, and it fit well with a rising wave of the random humor. Which, despite its decline in recent years, is something that I feel still has a place, but only a talented few really know how to pull it off without it being irritating. I consider Batman and Spider-Man to be kind of a masterclass example of this. I would attribute this to its sense of being random with purpose. Ironically, the origins of the series were strictly random for the sake of random, but it eventually became a more planned and guided effort, and for that reason I think it still holds up, while others that operate in that style of humor have faded away. While Alex and Lindsay were animation majors in college, the students were asked to watch a rather avant-garde play with a cacophony of noise and imagery. Afterwards, their assignment was to create an animation with two stipulations. One, it must feature a character that they had already drawn, and two, they must incorporate three props from that play. These two qualifiers laid the foundation for this series. Lindsay used to work at a comic shop, and Alex had doodled a fat Spider-Man to make her laugh. The props of a phone, bed, and sandwich were all things that had been featured in that play. About a year after that assignment was handed in, Alex came back to it adding color and sound effects and throwing it up on YouTube. The blog Drawn picked it up and helped it go viral, with Mondo soon approaching Alex to make a series. With little else to go on, he made two more random shorts. These three shorts are the ones that are random and only random. There is a marked shift in the series in episode 4 from 100% random to an obsessive continuity once Lindsay took over writing. The main rule I set out for Batman and Spider-Man is that everything is canon. Nothing enrages me more in comics and movies when everything is undone because the episode ended or simple retconning. In Batman Spider-Man, once something has happened, it affects the show forever. We keep a running list of destruction to make sure it all stays broken. I asked her what it was like coming into a directionless series and making something more concrete from it. It was initially quite difficult with the pieces Alex had established for me to play with from the initial three episodes. I wanted to build naturally off them so the series had a feeling of growing in a way that made sense and didn't drive away people that enjoyed the strangeness of the first few, but instead felt like a purposeful direction. Alex adding a pumpkin, later known as Pumpkin, I think is a reference to how I tend to collect a large amount of them in the fall, and he ended up being an important bridge to vault into more complex storylines as I built him up into a somewhat realistic character and not a gourd. Well, he's still a gourd, you understand. 
the production of the show changed rather dramatically, with Lindsay taking the time to outline the key events of a season, including a list of internal established rules of their world, seemingly small things like a pumpkin being introduced, tuba being a girl, or cereal turning you green. The payoff of a gag is so much more rewarding to the viewer if you've hinted at it all along. Pumpkin rotting over the course of several episodes was especially funny because no one really noticed at first, but a few episodes in, we're really concerned for the little guy. The series was entirely their own, and they enjoyed the freedom given to do whatever they wanted. One of the few notes on the series Mondo Media ever gave was asking them to make more fake superheroes to help the series appeal to a wider audience. My favorite personal addition is probably those guys, aka the basement monsters. The joke is that after the initial appearances aside, they're not even really parodies of Batman and Spider-Man. They're as uh, far away as possible, which is kind of the gag. To save Mondo and also to razz them, the basement guys appeared. They stopped trying to meddle with the show after that. They are truly my favorite characters, though. I recently rewatched the series in anticipation of Later Alligator, which then led to this interview and this video. The two aspects of this series that I think work the best, and make it as special as it is, are both tied up in this nuance and slight misdirection. The best things are the animation and the story. The scribbly style of drawing hides the fact that the animation is very technically complex, with everything being drawn frame by frame and the characters and camera rarely standing still. Despite the limited color palette and simple designs, they never take the easy way out. Angles are always exaggerated and the camera is always dynamic. And just the way the characters move is insane. Lindsay says the iconic Batman morphs are purely Alex. He's too much of a natural at it. And with the story, this seemingly random string of events hides the fact that there's a real story here with heart and soul. These characters have personalities, feel love and loss, care for one another, and represent a gold standard of what it means to be friends. Both this layered animation and storytelling act as their own running gags. Lindsay and Alex understand story structure and are both very talented drawers. Instead, this wild, goofy filter is applied to everything, ensuring that every frame, sentence, and second of these short are utilized to their full extent for additional humor. Animation provides a unique opportunity to do that, and these two understand that completely. This series isn't completely done yet. There was a Kickstarter a while back that worked to wrap up Batman and Spider-Man. Enough money was raised to fund a few stretch goal shorts, and those are being worked on as often as possible. I asked Lindsay with the amount of long-running gags, self-referential humor, and narrative consistency, the series has cultivated a library of imitable moments and characters. I was personally aware of one animation by Hood Boy that mashed up Batman the Animated Series' opening, done in Batman style. Yes, I love this. I remember when it came out how entirely impressed I was with the effort and great animation. It's a fantastic piece and really full of love for both source materials. I was curious if over the years if she had seen any references or deep pulls from the series show up anywhere else. One of the most flattering is probably that I was told when I was working on the Cartoon Network show Clarence that Clarence drew inspiration from Batman Spider-Man. I couldn't believe the full circle of something like that. It made me feel really special. A friend of mine working for Sony Animation told me they tried to slip a Spider-Man into Spider-Verse, but legal pulled it out. I do believe, however, that a Batman reference managed to make its way into one of the Arkham Asylum games. If anyone can track down that reference, you gotta let me know. Speaking of Clarence, I think it's a good time to segue into a few other things Lindsay has worked on between Batman and Spider-Man and later Alligator. You'll find a number of projects these two are attached to, done during their early days of animating when they were following the lead of a specific vision or established style of someone else. And while I won't dig too deep into those projects, I think it's important to realize that animators don't often get their start doing things for themselves. Freelancing is a risky business, and day jobs and guaranteed gigs can be an important way for keeping food on the table while you chase your passion project. Lindsay handled the animation for Mappy the series, and contributed heavily to Dick Figures the movie. In either one of these you might not see the distinct style, timing, or fluidity that either of these two are known for, but I just want to highlight that pursuing jobs like this is never anything to feel shame about. They are important stepping stones and provide you the means to work on other projects. That's just my two cents so as not to deter viewers who may think successful animators always break out doing entirely their own thing. With enough time and dedication you can make a name for yourself that people may specifically be begin to seek you out. Lindsay was able to work on shorts like her Game Grumps animated segment, Don't Do Anything. One of the most creative Game Grumps animated, and probably my personal favorite. The moment she chose to animate came from a Dragon Ball game, and the snippet of text and the animation couldn't have less to do with that. 
animation is a sandbox and you should do whatever you want with it. It may not have had the same viral qualities as their other series, but Lindsay says despite only having three episodes, she personally recommends looking at her series Daffodil. When you're more established with works like Batman and Spider Man or this individual animated segment, you can start to look forward to more contracts and gigs that specifically seek you out for your style. All of this effort and dedication, usually on top of day jobs, eventually led Small Boo down an elaborate and inspirational path. Working on Clarence, whose creators themselves were fans of Batman and Spider Man, opened a door at Cartoon Network. Adam Muto, the showrunner of Adventure Time, sought them out. This led to them creating a seven-minute guest segment for the series during the episode Beyond the Grotto. The episode was 99% freedom, to be honest, which was lovely. The voices were already recorded, so we were not involved in the writing process, but we were given the freedom to reboard to our heart's content and do whatever we wanted. Grotto is one of my favorite things we've worked on. The amazing result and strong reception of what became of Beyond the Grotto eventually led to Lindsay's Emmy Award-winning work on another Adventure Time episode to catch up. I just want to lay out that trajectory once more. A college project became a viral hit and eventually paved the way to a 2018 Emmy for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Animation for her character animation work in one of the most highly regarded animated TV shows of all time. Speaking to the impact of the show, I believe Adventure Time opened a door to allow whimsy and continuity that don't necessarily fit into an action show specific archetype to be able to play with more serialized elements. That humor style still permeates the scene even a decade later, which is saying something as well. The writing is lasting and prolific the way, say, Ren and Stimpy or Invader Zim were in terms of causing cultural ripples in cartoons. She also praises what this show did for independent animators. Once they were more established and had the flexibility, they featured guest animators on a regular basis, helping kickstart careers and boost the exposure of these independent artists. And since we were on the subject, I probed a little. Given the opportunity to be a guest animator on either of those series, which would she choose? Zim, for sure. Call me Jonan. Knowing how inspirational Lindsay's work has been to so many animators, I wanted to ask her for a few directed examples of what influenced her. I'll put together a playlist of sorts in the video description if anyone wants to further explore any of these titles. She had dreams of being an animator from a young age, but remembers her first true moment of inspiration coming from A Bug's Life when she was in about 7th grade. I remember very fondly seeing it in theaters. There's a scene early on in that film full of beautiful leaves that had light sifting through them, and I remember thinking I wanted to make something as lovely as that. When discussing favorites of hers over the years, she pointed to a short called Labyrinth Labyrinthos within the sci-fi shorts compilation Neo Tokyo. That particular short within the collection was directed by a favorite of hers, Rintaro. She warns, it's a little hard to find, but reassures it's incredibly inspirational to me. It has an indescribable atmosphere. There's a dynamism in the camera work and a refusal to take the simple approach to a shot that I feel is reflected in Lindsay's work. Considering Batman and Spider Man has been produced alongside Mondo and her work on dick figures, I asked Lindsay if she had a personal favorite Mondo series of her own. My true love on Mondo is, and will forever be, black and white. Look it up. I'll admit it seemed like a bit much for me at first, but once you get in the rhythm and watch a few episodes, you can see that there's some of those same deceptive qualities in the writing and animation. There's more going on here than there originally seems to be. If we want to scale up to favorite animated films, Lindsay had a few deep pulls, creating a fascinating collection that will definitely warrant adding a few new films to my own watch list. Lou Over the Wall The Triplets of Belleville Ratatouille James and the Giant Peach Redline and Dofus Julith I feel kind of like I'm reading out nominations for an Oscar. I realize that's a pretty eclectic seeming mix, but I do feel there is a thread there. And not afraid of her own guilty pleasures, she adds, Can I mention some bad animated films I love anyway? Because I just really love We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. I'm mocked for it relentlessly, but there, I said it. I just think it's really imaginative. And while we only really glossed over those specific films, it seemed Lindsay couldn't help but gush over two specific animators that she views as being particularly influential in her work. Masaki Yuasa and Richard Williams. Yuasa's approach to filmmaking and animation as a medium in general feel most directly inspiring to me. There's a value to the work he creates in that I really feel like he uses animation to its full potential. The things he makes couldn't be accomplished with actors in film, and it relishes in that. So the animation itself feels like an essential character to the process. His work as a director is really prolific and unique. I really admire how him it is. Similarly, I admire Richard Williams for a lot of the same values. 
His work is very much an acquired taste, and you could argue that The Thief and the Cobbler is sort of a mess, which is somewhat of a thread in his directing. But he had incredible vision and didn't compromise that, even if sometimes it was to the work's detriment. He really believed and cared about animation as an art form, and a way to express something beautiful visually. I admire that kind of passion and commitment down to my bones. He made some wild things to behold, and invaluable teaching tools as well. What a really special life. Looking at more modern animation, I wanted to know if there were any examples that are similarly exciting and appeal to her own preferences. OKKO OK makes me laugh a lot. It has some of the funniest drawings and animation airing right now. Also check out Home Adventures of Tip and O on Netflix. I know, but trust me. Wrapping up our conversation of inspirations and segueing into her new game, Later Alligator, I was curious which games Lindsay finds visually striking or with standout animation. I really love the look of Wonder Song. You know what my favorite animation-centric game probably is? Loco Roco. I love Loco Roco. She also cites the Professor Layton series, but I'm going to cover that more in a minute. Now that we've explored Lindsay's career as an animator for TV, shorts, and more, and heard all about her personal influences, I want to end this video by building some additional excitement for later Alligator, her first real foray into the video game industry. The game was set for release on September 16th, but is being delayed a couple days for some last minute polish and bug fixing, but the 16th was actually also Lindsay's birthday, so happy belated birthday. Joe and Conrad Kraling make up Pillow Fight, and are also longtime friends of the Small Buteras. Small Boo made the animated intro for their game, Ghosts of Miami, but they were friends long before that, unrelated to work. It was Joe and Conrad who asked whether or not Lindsay had a game idea of her own, and it turns out she did. And that game happened to involve alligators and an alternate reality version of New York City. Pat the Alligator, our protagonist, is a character that Lindsay claims has rather small origins. I draw this alligator a lot, and he's been animated before too. I think I've been drawing Pat in various forms since college. I just think drawing silly animals is funny, basically, and since Pillow Fight's expertise lay in visual novels dating sims at the time, the original idea kind of began as, talk to this silly alligator about murders. It grew from there. She also swears that the concept for the game came before the title, and this wasn't all just an excuse to make something with a cutesy catchy title, but I'm still not positive I believe her on that one. I've never seen The Godfather and have a mere approximate knowledge of it through cultural osmosis, so I thought it would be funny to make something like that, but stupid. And while I do love the synopsis of The Godfather but stupid more than I can describe, I was curious what she took inspiration from as a first time game developer. Definitely Professor Layton, which is essentially also a visual novel with mini games. Having an intimate knowledge of the flow of that series really helped me to be able to wrap my mind around game flow coming from a film background, especially since they have distinct cinematic elements to them as well. The original Layton trilogy has some sincerely baller traditional animation in it. Seriously, movie quality cutscenes. With Lindsay and Alex writing and animating, Pillow Fight coding, and Too Mellow handling the music and SFX, I think fans of point-and-click games, of animation, of creative storytelling, and of course of Lindsay's inspiring work are all in for a real treat with later Alligator. I just really hope it makes people laugh a bunch. Being able to crack people up is the skill I value most in myself, I think, because I have a hard time finding a lot of stuff that really makes me laugh. When something makes me really laugh, I love it forever. I hope the game will inspire a lot of giggles and good moods. So with the unbridled promise of this game just around the corner, and not wanting to put too much pressure on Lindsay and Small Boo, I ventured as to whether or not they knew where their focus would be after the release of Later Alligator. We're working on a feature film for the next three years. For real. We're really deep into it. This project has already been in the works for a long time, and at this stage we only have a small glimpse of what's to come. But it's astounding to me to think that the creators of this well-known series with incredibly short average run times are suddenly taking on a full movie. Going from shorts to TV to a game to a full movie, Lindsay's career has really covered it all. And after absorbing as many of her recommendations as possible while putting this together, I'm more excited than ever to see how her talents translate to a feature film. Congratulations to Lindsay on all her success, and thank you to her for her inspirational journey over the years. I can hardly wait to play through later Alligator, and I look forward to many years of delightful offerings coming from herself, Alex, and Small Boo Studio. And while it may have just been your birthday, it is stunning what you've accomplished in that time, and we all look forward to a very long, bright, continued career. So thank you once again, Lindsay, for the interview. Thank you to all of you for watching. 
You guys are going to have to let me know how you feel about a focused look at a single creator like this. I've done several of these episodes now with an interview component. We're going to have to work something out on the Patreon to determine which topics to tackle next, and maybe open things up to a Patreon round of questioning if we do more interviews. I'm just spitballing, something I'm looking forward to. Thank you guys so much for watching. As soon as we have an episode one of Later Alligator here on the channel for you guys to watch, it'll appear in one of these end cards. Maybe you give that a watch while you're here, and we'll see you again soon.